Mitrice LaVon Richardson was born on April 30th, 1985. A native of Los Angeles, Mitrice was the only child of Michael Richardson and Latisse Sutton. Latisse and Michael were young parents. In fact, they were still in high school when Mitrice was born. As a result, she would spend a majority of her time with her grandmother, Mildred, which would in turn give her parents time to attend school and work. When Mitrice was only four years old, her father Michael would run into some trouble with the law. Ultimately, he would find himself sentenced to prison for a term of eight years, of which he would serve four. It was during this time that Mitrice's mother would meet and marry a man named Larry Sutton. She and Larry gathered up Mitrice and the three relocated to Covina, California, a suburb that sits just east of Los Angeles. The move proved to be good for the family. The hustle and bustle of the big city could be a bit much, but in comparison, Covina offered more of a small town vibe. Mitrice was described as extremely intelligent and goal-oriented. It's said that when she did something, she applied herself 100%. Growing up, Mitrice was well-behaved at home and never really gave her parents any trouble. She knew the difference between right and wrong and could usually be counted on to make positive choices. Loved ones say that Mitrice was a determined young woman who kept her focus at all times. Upon graduating high school, she attended Cal State University at Fullerton. Since the campus was closer to LA, she opted to move in with her grandmother, who still lived in the Los Angeles area. During her time at Cal State, Mitrice excelled in her studies. In fact, she consistently held a 4.0 GPA while she was there. In 2008, she would graduate with honors, earning her BA in psychology. Mitrice was doing very well, and it seemed that nothing but success lie ahead of her. After graduating, Mitrice considered attending graduate school, as she now had her sights set on a master's degree. In the meantime, she took on a couple jobs to keep money in her pocket. During the day, she would work as a clerk at a shipping company. She also worked as a go-go dancer at a local lesbian nightclub. Mitrice was in no way shy about her sexuality. She'd come out to her family just a few years prior. At first, she wasn't even sure how they would react to the news. However, they showered Mitrice with love and were fully supportive of her lifestyle. She had even began dating another young lady by the name of Tessa Moon. The two had met while working together at the shipping company. Tessa Moon was just as full of life and ambition as Mitrice. Those close to the couple say that they were the perfect match. They would date for two years before breaking up in 2009. Family believes Mitrice took the breakup pretty hard. After all, she adored Tessa, the two had been extremely close. It was soon after the breakup that Mitrice began to exhibit some strange behaviors. Mitrice had always been a social butterfly, constantly communicating with family and friends alike. But after her split with Tessa, she became more and more withdrawn, no longer replying to text messages and returning calls as quickly as she once had. To those in her inner circle, this was very odd. Even more strange were Mitrice's social media posts at the time. She'd alternate between her MySpace and Facebook pages, often posting ominous messages and incoherent rants back to back. When she did converse over text, her messages rarely made sense. There would be times where she would respond with what could only be described as meaningless babble. Her loved ones had certainly become worried. However, Mitrice wasn't one to openly discuss problems or struggles that arose in her life. Oftentimes, she preferred to deal with these matters in private, and this time was no different. When those close to Mitrice voiced their concerns, she just told them everything was fine and they had nothing to worry about. September 16th, 2009 was a Wednesday. It began as a normal day for Mitrice. That morning, she reported to work at the shipping company. According to her co-workers, she seemed to be in an upbeat mood. They say nothing really seemed out of the ordinary. Around noon, Mitrice's lunch break came around. She left work, but never returned to finish her shift. 
her co-workers say that they had no clue she planned on leaving for the day. Later that afternoon, Maitrice made a visit to her grandmother's house. The two would usually have dinner every Wednesday. However, Maitrice told her grandmother that she planned to have dinner in Malibu that night instead. She explained that she wished to be close to the ocean and wanted to start the 40 minute drive soon. According to her grandmother, nothing about Maitrice's behavior seemed odd at the time. She wished her granddaughter a safe trip and the two said their goodbyes. It was shortly after 7 p.m. when Maitrice arrived in Malibu. She spent some time watching the sunset before heading to get something to eat. Now, even though Maitrice was a native of California, she wasn't familiar with the city of Malibu. This was one of only a few times she'd even been to the area. Nonetheless, she happened upon a restaurant called Joffrey's. The restaurant is located along the Pacific Coast Highway and offers amazing views of the ocean. Upon arriving at the Joffrey's restaurant, Maitrice encountered a valet driver at the entrance. He explained the valet policy to Maitrice and asked her to wait patiently in her car while he parked another patron's vehicle. He was gone only briefly, but upon returning, he discovered Maitrice had exited her vehicle and entered his personal vehicle. He left the door open by mistake and it was only a few feet from the restaurant's entrance. When he asked Maitrice what she was doing, she responded with nonsensical comments, saying at one point she needed to avenge the death of Michael Jackson. She sat in the car for a few minutes going through the employee CDs before ultimately getting out. Once she exited the vehicle, she handed the valet her keys and proceeded to enter the restaurant. She turned back to the valet and asked if Vanessa was inside. The valet told Maitrice that he wasn't aware of anyone by that name in the restaurant. As they walked inside, he mentioned Maitrice's offbeat behavior to one of the waitresses. By this point, he suspected that she may be intoxicated. Once Maitrice was set at her table, she ordered the Kobe beef steak and an Ocean Breeze cocktail, which consists of Sprite and coconut rum. Restaurant staff couldn't help but notice Maitrice's strange behavior while she waited for her food to be served. At one point, she even invited herself to another table with seven other customers. These seven people were complete strangers. Nonetheless, Maitrice took a seat and began to converse with them. According to these customers, Maitrice made a series of bizarre statements while seated with them, going so far as to say that she was from another planet. Once her steak arrived, she went back to her own table, but just long enough to finish her food, at which point she returned to the seven strangers and continued speaking with them. After a few minutes, the party of seven were ready to pay their bill and head out. According to restaurant staff, Maitrice attempted to mingle with them as they exited. However, she was stopped by the restaurant manager, who informed her that she hadn't paid her bill. Maitrice said that her bill had been covered by the seven customers, but the manager knew this was false. When he asked Maitrice how she intended to pay her $89 bill, she said that she had no money. The manager was already aware of Maitrice's antics throughout the night. At this point, he thought it best to contact the local police. As they waited for officers to arrive, Maitrice suggested that they contact her grandmother in order to collect payment. Her grandmother, Mildred, does recall the conversation with restaurant management. She says she provided her credit card number over the phone, but a signature was required to finalize the charge. Since this wasn't possible, the bill will remain unpaid. It was soon after this that sheriff's deputies arrived at the restaurant. They spoke with Maitrice and ended up conducting a sobriety test. She passed with flying colors. There was also no evidence that she was under the influence of any type of drugs. Police did search her vehicle, but at the time, her wallet wasn't visible inside. With absolutely no way to pay the $89 bill, the restaurant manager opted to press charges against Maitrice. At that point, she was handcuffed and read her rights. She would be taken to the Lost Hills Sheriff's Station nearby. She had only her car keys in her possession. Her vehicle, along with her phone and other belongings, was towed to a local tow yard. 
By this time, Latisse Sutton had already been informed of her daughter's predicament. She made a call to the Lost Hills Sheriff's Station and spoke to a deputy. She was told that Mitrice would be spending the night at the Sheriff's Station and wouldn't be released until the next morning. The drive from Covina to Malibu exceeds an hour, and it was already late. So Latisse said that she would just drive out the next morning to pick up her daughter. According to Latisse, the deputy promised to have Mitrice call her as soon as she arrived at the station. He explained that there was no reason Mitrice should be released any earlier than the following morning. With this, Latisse was relieved. She felt that at the least, her daughter was in a safe place and would remain there until she could arrive. She went on with her evening and expected to hear from her daughter at some point that night. When Mitrice arrived to the station, she was processed in and allowed time on the phone. Records that night show four outgoing calls, but none of these were to her mother. Deputies say that Mitrice did call her grandmother. They reported overhearing a phone conversation she was having. But Mitrice's grandmother says this wasn't the case. According to her, she last spoken with Mitrice when she called from the restaurant that night. Since Mitrice had used a desk phone with no recorded lines, there's no way to know exactly who she was talking to. Despite the information given to her mother, Mitrice would be released from the station at 12.28 a.m. on September 17th. When released, Mitrice had nothing but her car keys and the clothes on her back. Deputies say that since Mitrice was not intoxicated, they were unable to hold her any longer. They told her that she could wait in the lobby until morning, but she declined and instead left the station heading out into the night completely alone. There was no effort made to inform Latisse that her daughter was let go early. She wouldn't find this out until about 5.30 a.m. when she made another call to the station. When she learned that her daughter had been released overnight, she immediately became concerned. It had been over five hours, and she certainly hadn't heard from her daughter, so where could she be? Latisse called around to family and friends to see if anyone had spoken to Mitrice. Unfortunately, no one had heard from her. This prompted her to call the Lost Hill station again, this time to make a missing persons report. Upon calling, she was told that it was common practice to wait at least 24 hours to report someone missing. Deputies felt it was still a chance Mitrice could turn up, and they convinced Latisse of this as well. She agreed to give things a few hours, and she hoped for the best. It was around 6.30 a.m. when another call came into the sheriff's station. A retired news anchor had reported a young woman lurking in his yard. He said that he asked the woman if she was okay, and she said she was fine, that she was just resting. His home was only six miles from the police station, and the description he gave matched that of Mitrice Richardson. Regrettably, the caller took his eyes off my tree so he could call the police. When he returned to his yard, she was gone. Once officers arrived, they searched the area, but they too found no trace of my trees. It wasn't long after this that Latisse Sutton called the Lost Hill Station again. This time, she was informed of my trees' possible sighting. The location and circumstances of the sighting were strange to Latisse. She knew her daughter was not a fan of the outdoors, especially when it involved walking. Long walks were not Mitrice's cup of tea. It was evident that something was wrong. Latisse became even more determined to find her daughter as quickly as possible. It would be 48 hours before an official search would begin. Malibu Search and Rescue would mainly focus on the area surrounding the home of the news anchor, as this was the last place Mitrice was seen. Although canines did manage to pick up her scent, it was lost pretty quickly. All in all, the search for Mitrice Richardson would last only eight short hours. By the end, searchers had yet to find any trace of the 24-year-old. It seemed that she simply vanished into thin air. Since Mitrice's vehicle was still at the tow yard, investigators were able to search it. Her wallet hadn't been visible when the car was searched at the restaurant. However, it was found in the vehicle during this search. It contained her ID and a debit card with over $2,000 on it. This means that Mitrice could have easily paid for her bill at the restaurant the previous night. Also in the car was Mitrice's personal journal. 
Investigators initially hoped this would provide some clues as to where she could be. However, all they found inside were cryptic messages and random scribbles. No other helpful clues were found inside the vehicle. With no other leads, the investigation had reached a dead end. Over time, Mitrice's case would receive a great deal of media attention. Latice Sutton became very vocal about her disappointment in the investigation. She thought the deputies should have done more for her daughter. At the least, she felt that they could have offered Mitrice a ride back to her vehicle. After all, it was dark outside and Mitrice was alone and vulnerable. It's worth noting that famous actor Mel Gibson had once been held at the same Lost Hills Sheriff Station. Upon his release, he was offered a ride back to his vehicle. So why hadn't this been done for Mitrice? It does seem odd that they would just let her leave all by herself, especially when they knew that she had no wallet and no phone to call for help. As pressure mounted, a new search effort would be launched in January of 2010, about four months after Mitrice was reported missing. It's said that this search was one of the largest in LA County's history. In all, over 300 people volunteered to assist in the search. The effort covered about 18 square miles in the Malibu Canyon area. Participants wanted to leave no stone unturned. They searched creeks, hiking trails, and whatever other terrain came their way. Despite their attempts, no signs of my trees were found this time either. After no results were yielded from the search, the number of investigators assigned to Mitrice's case would slowly lessen. Within a few months, the case turned cold altogether. It was August 9, 2010, when two park rangers discovered human remains in the area of Gold Canyon. The location sits just east of the neighborhood of Montanito which is about five miles from the Lost Hills Sheriff Station. They discovered a skull, pelvic bone, and leg bone. They could see the victim had curly black hair, consistent with that of an African-American female. It would later be determined that the remains were indeed Mitrice Richardson. Upon discovering the remains, Rangers notified search and rescue personnel who, along with homicide detectives, were airlifted to the location. Protocol in these cases is to allow the coroner's team to examine the scene and remove the remains. But according to officials, this became a difficult task. As the coroner's team waited to be airlifted to the scene, there were other emergency calls that diverted their assigned helicopter. This, along with limited fuel, would long delay the arrival of the coroner's team. So the decision was made to remove the remains from the canyon without coroner personnel on site. The coroner manager would later say that no permission for this action had been granted. In any sense, this resulted in hardly any documentation of the remains as they were found that day. What could be verified in reports was that Mitrice was nude when she was discovered. Her clothing had been removed and strung about near the scene. Some articles of Mitrice's clothing were found as far as 100 feet from her remains. It was also noted that no gunshot wounds or other violent marks were present on the body. And lastly, it seemed that the remains hadn't been disturbed at all. Now with it being almost a year since Mitrice had been reported missing, it's likely that wildlife would have happened upon the remains at some point. After all, it was known that coyotes and certain large bird species were common in that area. Officials wondered if Mitrice's remains had been brought here after her death. However, with no signs of foul play, they would note Mitrice's cause of death is undetermined. In the years since Mitrice's remains were found, her family has continued to claim negligence on the part of the Lost Hills Sheriff's deputies. They believe Mitrice was experiencing a bipolar episode at the time. In their opinion, she should have never been able to leave the station by herself. The Richardson family filed numerous lawsuits in response to this. In 2011, Latisse Sutton and Michael Richardson were awarded $450,000 apiece. Mitrice's case has received widespread media attention. In November of 2009, she appeared on the cover of People magazine. In addition to this, her story has been featured on the Investigation Discovery series Disappeared. 
family, and other interested parties are hopeful that more details will surface in Mitrice's death. Despite extensive coverage of the case in media, there's been no official suspects or theories that hold weight. There's also never been any explanation for Mitrice's behavior leading up to her disappearance. Though her parents believed that she was experiencing a bipolar episode, she'd never been officially diagnosed with any mental disorders. So what happened to Mitrice after she left the sheriff's station that night? Exactly what or who did she encounter? This case seems to be a textbook example of a complete mystery. Let's cross our fingers and hope that time will reveal the details and how this tragedy came to be.